Hello, and thank you for taking the time to review this recorded webinar. If you are a domestic worker or know someone who is, here is what you need to know about Seattle's Domestic Workers Ordinance and the Fair Employment Practice Ordinance. This presentation was created by the Seattle Office of Labor Standards and the Office for Civil Rights. My name is Jennifer Molina, and my colleague Nick and Helen Camp and I will be serving as your facilitators today. This webinar is for informational purposes only and is not for the purpose of providing legal advice, creating an agency decision, or establishing an attorney-client relationship between the Office of Labor Standards or the Office for Civil Rights and the viewer. Any responses to specific questions are based on the facts as we understand them and are not intended to apply to any other situations. If you need legal advice, please consult an attorney. The information you will receive is split into two sections. First, you will learn about the workplace protections established by the Domestic Workers Ordinance, which is administered by the Office of Labor Standards. During the second part of the webinar, you will learn about protections against discrimination and harassment established by the Fair Employment Practices Ordinance, which is administered by the Office for Civil Rights. Our goal is to provide you with a comprehensive overview of your rights. By the end of this webinar, you will be familiar with the essence of the ordinance. You will be able to distinguish who is covered and who is not. You will learn all about the ordinance provisions and you will get useful resources such as a model nurse of rights and the contact information for both of our offices. Without further delay, let's dive in. The Seattle Office of Labor Standards, also known as OLS, is responsible for the implementation of the Domestic Workers Ordinance. In 2011, the city of Seattle passed its first labor standard. At that time, Seattle was only the fourth jurisdiction in the country to require all employers to provide sick leave benefits. The Paid Sick and Safe Time Ordinance took effect in 2012. The Seattle Office for Civil Rights was responsible for enforcing the ordinance. Between 2011 and 2015, the city of Seattle passed a total of four ordinances. In 2014, Seattle City Council passed a legislation creating the Seattle Office of Labor Standards to implement and enforce the city's labor laws. The mission of our office is grounded in workplace equity. OLS is mandated to implement the city's labor standards as well as other ordinances that the city may enact in the future. As of 2021, the Office of Labor Standards oversees a total of 16 ordinances. Our private and free services include labor standards investigations to enforce Seattle's labor standards ordinances, outreach and education to workers and businesses, compliance assistance for businesses, as well as resources and referrals. Language interpretation, translation, and accommodations are available upon request. The states and cities across the country are leading the way, showing that bringing dignity and economic security to domestic work is good for everyone. According to the National Domestic Workers Alliance, there are over 2 million domestic workers across the United States who work in individual homes, serving millions as caretakers for seniors, people with disabilities, children, and taking care of our homes. As of now, a total of 10 states have passed domestic workers' bills of rights, with Virginia being the 10th state to pass legislation. The city of Seattle was the first municipality to pass protections for domestic workers, followed by the city of Philadelphia. The Seattle Domestic Workers Ordinance came from community organizing, just like all our other Seattle labor standards. The ordinance gives basic workplace protections to approximately 33,000 domestic workers in the Seattle area. It also requires establishing a domestic workers standards board that makes recommendations for future policy changes. If you are a worker who provides paid domestic services to individuals or households in private homes, as a nanny, house cleaner, home care worker, gardener, cook, and or household manager, here are some things you need to know. The Seattle Domestic Workers Ordinance requires that domestic workers are paid the Seattle minimum wage. 
It requires that hiring entities provide you with an uninterrupted meal period and rest break, including financial compensation if your work responsibilities require you to work without a break. It provides 24 hours off for workers that leave where they're employed, and it prohibits hiring entities from confiscating your documents or other personal effects. The ordinance covers both employees and independent contractors. Once again, it applies to nannies, house cleaners, home care workers, gardeners, cooks, and or household managers. Regardless of whether they are hourly or salary employees, independent contractors, full-time or part-time workers, or temporary workers, and it's important to mention that a worker's immigration status does not impact the coverage or removes its protections. As a matter of policy, the City of Seattle does not ask about the immigration status of anyone using city services. It excludes, however, three classes of otherwise covered workers. These categories include workers in a family relationship with the hiring entity, home care workers paid through public funds, and casual workers. In the next few slides, I will go over what defines casual basis work, family relationship, and public funds. But before we do that, let's quickly define what is a hiring entity and what types of hiring entities are covered by the law. Well, under the Domestic Workers Ordinance, a hiring entity is defined as any person, groups of persons, or entity that pays for the services of a domestic worker. It also includes any entity or person acting directly or indirectly in the interest of a hiring entity in relation to the domestic worker. If a household or individual contracts with a separate business to employ domestic workers, that business is solely liable for violations of the ordinance unless the household or individual interferes with a worker's rights. Examples include, but are not limited to, any entity that has the power to determine the amount the hiring entities pay for domestic services, has the power to determine the amount the domestic workers receive for services provided, has the power to facilitate or terminate the domestic worker's relationship with the hiring entity, including the addition, removal, or promotion of the worker on an online platform, or engages a subcontractor to perform all or part of the agreed upon services. Now that we know how the ordinance defines a hiring entity and the types of hiring entities cover, let's talk about the types of domestic workers who are now covered. Casual basis refers to work that is one, irregular, uncertain, or incidental in nature or duration, and two, different in nature from the type of pay work in which the worker is customarily engaged. Whether a worker is working on a casual basis depends on the totality of circumstances. A domestic worker is customarily engaged in the type of domestic work for which they are being paid unless they voluntarily disclose otherwise to a hiring entity. Family relationship refers to the child, spouse, parent, grandchild, grandparent, or sibling of either the hiring entity or the hiring entity's spouse, or any domestic worker whose close association with the hiring entity is substantially similar in nature to a family relationship. It is assumed that a domestic worker does not have a close association considerably similar in nature to a family relationship unless the totality of circumstances otherwise demonstrates such a close association. Factors that might help demonstrate this include a personal relationship between a um, domestic worker and a hiring entity existed prior to the work arrangement, or the worker makes a voluntary and knowing assertion acknowledging a close association substantially similar in nature to a family relationship. A voluntary and knowing assertion is one where the worker was not pressured or manipulated to make it, and where the worker was informed that the potential consequences of asserting a close association is that the worker may not be entitled to the labor protections provided by the ordinance. Babysitters that perform the same duties as nannies are covered by the ordinance, unless they are working on a casual basis or are in a family relationship with the household. A worker who is paid through public funds is not covered under the domestic workers ordinance 
This applies to local, state, and federal governments, including but not limited to Medicare, Medicaid, the Older Americans Act, and the Veterans Administrations. They are excluded from coverage. If an individual or household contracts with another hiring entity that has an employment relationship with a domestic worker, that contractor is solely liable unless the individual or household interferes with the rights established by the ordinance. This could look like assigning so much work that a worker could not reasonably take their meal period or rest break, expressing an expectation that the worker must skip breaks, monitoring the worker while they're on break, such that the worker doesn't feel comfortable to make personal choices as to how they use their time, or encouraging a worker to accept payment below minimum wage. If a worker is employed by two households, both households are liable for the rights of the domestic worker. This joint and several liability will likely exist even if a violation happens at one home and not another. For example, we have two families. Let's refer to them as family A and family B. They each have one child and together employ one nanny. The nanny cares for both children at the same time, and the location of care given alternates between the family's two homes. Every now and then, family A will ask the nanny to do chores while they're at family A's house, such that the nanny cannot take breaks or meal periods. Family B does not assign additional chores, but in this case, both families are jointly liable for the lack of breaks at family A's house. Now let's talk about minimum wage. The ordinance requires that Seattle households and other hiring entities ensure that their domestic workers receive a minimum wage. Every year, Seattle's minimum wage increases on January 1st. The minimum wage for 2021 is $16.69 an hour. And because most hiring entities are small employers, they must pay the minimum wage rate assigned to small employers under the Seattle minimum wage ordinance. That is 16, 69 an hour or 15 an hour if the worker receives tips or employer provided medical benefits. So here's an example. In 2021, a hiring entity can pay the worker 15 an hour so long as the employee is earning at least $1.69 an hour in tips. Or if the hiring entity contributes at least $1.69 an hour in payments towards employees' medical benefit plan. As for large employers, the minimum wage rate is six and six nine an hour, regardless whether the worker receives tips or receives medical benefits from the employer. Now you know the minimum wage rate that domestic workers are required to receive for their services. But what about deductions? Well, a hiring entity can make deductions from a paycheck that go below minimum wage, but only when the worker expects explicitly authorize the deduction in writing in advance for a lawful purpose and for the benefit of the worker. Here are a few things you have to include in the written authorization. Otherwise, it won't be a valid deduction. It must be written in the language that both you and the hiring entity are most comfortable using. It has to be clear that you're authorizing the deduction from your wages, the amount and reason for the deduction, as well as effective dates. It also needs to say that in the future, you can cancel this authorization in writing. And last but not least, it has to be signed by you. Under the domestic workers ordinance, you have the right to receive a 30 minute meal period for every five hours work and a 10 minute rest break for every four hours work. Rest breaks are always paid and meal periods may be unpaid depending on the circumstances. So what is a meal period? What is a rest break? When are they required? Can you waive it? What happens if it's interrupted? Well, let's talk about that. Once again, a meal period is 30 minutes of an interrupted time when the domestic worker is completely relieved from work obligations. This means that you're allowed to rest and make other personal choices as to how you spend your time during your break, like eating a snack, making personal calls, or attending to personal business. A meal period is required when you work more than five consecutive hours. The 30-minute meal period must be provided between the second and fifth working hour. During the meal period, you are not required to engage in any physical or mental exertion or be required to discuss a work task. Now, 
It's important to mention that domestic workers who work five consecutive hours or less do not need to be provided a meal period. The meal period can be unpaid, but only when you are completely relieved from work obligations and receive 30 minutes of uninterrupted time to spend at your discretion. During unpaid meal periods, the hiring entity cannot require you to attend to any work obligations. For example, be required to answer the phone calls or keep an eye out for the deliveries. Meal periods must be paid when you are required to remain at the house on call and ready to return to work, but you are relieved of other work obligations. For example, Brenna is a nanny that takes care of a seven-month-old baby during the weekdays from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Baby Rose typically naps from 12 p.m. to 2 p.m. every day and does not wake up. Because of this, Rena is required to remain in the home at all times. When Baby Rose is down for nap time, Rena is able to go into another room and take the 30-minute meal period to rest, eat a snack, or make other personal choices as to how to spend those 30 minutes. Because Rena is required to stay at the house, the meal period cannot be unpaid. You may choose to waive your meal period if your work obligations allow you to take an unpaid meal period. To be a valid deduction, you must be aware of the effective dates of the waiver, the consequences of waiving, um, like you won't receive an unpaid meal period, and that you may cancel the waiver at any time. This has to be done in the language that you're most comfortable with, and employers are strongly encouraged to provide documentation of the waiver in writing if you request a meal period waiver. The waiver must be voluntary and you are not to be pressured, manipulated into waiving the meal period. Now let's talk about rest breaks. A rest break is 10 minutes of uninterrupted time when you are completely relieved from work obligations. As with meal periods, this means that you're allowed to rest, eat a snack, make personal calls, or make other personal choices as to how you spend your time during the break. During your rest break, you cannot be required to attend to any work obligations. Hiring entities must allow a rest break of no less than 10 minutes for every four hours of working time. The rest break must be allowed no later than the end of the third working hour of the four hour of lock time. Unlike a meal period, you cannot waive your right to a rest break and the hiring entity must always pay for rest breaks. Hiring entities may require you to remain on call at the house during your paid rest breaks, provided the purpose of the rest break is not compromised. This means that you're not required to engage in any work obligations and you have the right to rest or choose to how to spend your time during the break. If you are called back to work during a rest break or meal period, you are entitled to restart the clock on the meal period or break. If you are unable to get 10 minutes of uninterrupted time before the fourth hour of work begins, the rest break is considered missed. If you are unable to get 30 minutes of uninterrupted time before the fifth hour of work ends, the meal period is considered missed. Here's an example. Michael, a home care worker, is taking a paid meal period, but the client needs help during this time, and Michael must return to work to assist the client. The paid meal period is interrupted. Michael is entitled to restart the clock on their 30 minute paid meal period, but if they're unable to get the 30 minutes of uninterrupted time before the end of the fifth hour of work, the meal period is considered a miss and Michael must then be paid for the entire time as well as an additional 30 minutes of pay as described in the next slide. If you do not receive a compliant rest break or a compliant meal period, you are entitled to additional pay. For each missed meal period, whether paid or unpaid, the employer must pay for the hour's work plus an additional 30 minutes of pay. For each missed paid rest break, the employer must pay for the hour's work plus an additional 10 minutes of pay. A hiring entity may be in violation of the law and subject to additional fines and penalties if you miss your rest break or meal period. However, if the nature of your work responsibilities make it impossible or infeasible to take a meal period or break, the hiring entity must only provide the additional pay as previously described and will not be subject to additional fines or penalties.
the Seattle Office of Labor Standards will consider them to be impossible or infeasible for you to take a meal period or rest break when the nature of the work does not permit a meal or rest break without endangering the health and safety of those under your care. For example, children or vulnerable adults. Or there are otherwise compelling circumstances that will have been unforeseen by the employer at the time the work responsibilities were assigned. Households and other hiring entities are not required to return home and physically relieve you from your work obligations. That said, they must provide an opportunity for compliant meal periods and rest breaks. There are three ways to comply with the ordinance's requirements regarding meal periods and rest breaks, depending on the nature of the domestic work and the circumstances of the household. Number one, if you are able to be completely relieved of work obligations during your break times, the 10-minute meal period may be unpaid, but the 10-minute rest breaks must always be paid. You may waive your meal period, but the paid rest breaks may not be waived. Number two, if you must remain on site, on call, and ready to work during your breaks, the hiring entity must provide a paid meal period, and this period cannot be waived by you. Rest breaks remain paid and may not be waived. Number three, if the nature of your work responsibilities make it impossible or infeasible to take rest breaks or meal periods, the hiring entity must provide additional pay if you miss meal periods and rest breaks. For an, uh, for an eight hour day, this will amount to an extra 50 minutes worth of pay above the compensation for the time work. If you are a domestic worker who lives or sleeps at a place of employment, you cannot be required to work more than six consecutive days for the same hiring entity without an unpaid 24-hour period of consecutive rest. For purposes of determining six consecutive work days, think of any amount of work done in a 24-hour period qualifies as a day of work. A 24-hour period of consecutive rest means that you are completely relieved from work obligations, not required to remain at the house, and not required to return to work if called. A worker may waive a day of rest, but only if the worker does it knowingly and voluntarily. To be a knowing waiver and a valid waiver, the worker must be informed of the rights um, that they are waiving and the language that the worker is most comfortable using, the effective dates of the waiver, the consequences of waiving it, and the rights to cancel this waiver at any time. The Seattle Office of Labor Standards has made available a model notice of rights in English, Spanish, and other languages. You can find it in the Domestic Workers Ordinance section of our website. The model notice of rights includes an explanation of the domestic workers' rights provided by the ordinance and a space for the hiring entity to state the established pay for the provision of domestic services. Hiring entities are not required to provide domestic workers with the model notice of rights. That said, OLS strongly encourages hiring entities to provide domestic workers with this information. Among other benefits, a record of providing a notice of rights may help demonstrate compliance with the ordinance if a hiring entity becomes the subject of an OLS investigation. OLS has the authority to conduct investigations and impose remedies for violations of this ordinance. However, OLS recognizes that outreach to and education for domestic workers and hiring entities is the first priority. Domestic workers need to be informed of their rights and households will have to understand their obligations as hiring entities. At OLS, we look forward to working closely with stakeholders to develop enforcement procedures that will meet the unique needs of domestic workers and hiring entities. Hiring entities are not allowed to confiscate any of your original documents or other personal effects. For example, your passport, work permit, visa, or money. The domestic workers ordinance also prohibits them from retaliating against you if you decide to exercise your rights under the ordinance. Hiring entities may not take an adverse action. They cannot make threats of terminating services or reporting someone to a federal immigration authority. It is now time to dive into the second portion of the webinar. Once again, it will cover protections against discrimination and harassment under the Fair Employment Practices Ordinance. Hello, my name is Nikki, and I'm with the Seattle Office for Civil Rights. 
I'm going to talk about the City of Seattle laws that protect domestic workers from discrimination at work. Civil rights protections exist in workplaces, public places, housing, and contracting. This means that in these settings, it's illegal for people to be discriminated against based on their membership in a protected class. Today, we'll be talking about civil rights protections, domestic workers, and employment discrimination. So what is a protected class? A protected class is a group of people with a common characteristic who are legally protected from being discriminated against based on their membership in that group. For example, I am a woman. If an employer were to discriminate against me based on my sex, for example, by refusing to hire me for a job that they prefer to hire a man for, that could be a violation of the law. The discrimination must be happening because of my membership in the protected class for the Office for Civil Rights to be able to investigate. There are many protected classes in the city of Seattle, including race, color, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, age, disability, marital status, national origin, ancestry, political ideology, religion, creed, veteran or military status, parental status, and retaliation. As a reminder, a domestic worker is defined by the law as anyone who's paid to provide domestic services to an individual or household as a nanny, house cleaner, home care worker, gardener, cook, or household manager. One of the big changes that the Domestic Workers Ordinance created was to extend discrimination protections not just to employees, but to domestic workers who are considered independent contractors. However, the law does not apply to those who are working on a casual basis, are in a family relationship with the hiring entity, or are home care workers who are paid through public funds. Domestic workers have the same protections as any other employees under our laws. This includes the right to not be subjected to discrimination based on membership in a protected class. A few common types of discrimination that domestic workers may encounter include different treatment, harassment, reasonable accommodation, and retaliation. There are other types of discrimination as well. Different treatment means that a worker is treated differently in employment than other workers, and that the reason for the different treatment is their membership in a protected class. This can include differences in pay, access to breaks, or other conditions of employment. One example would be a worker who is paid $16 an hour and finds out that a previous employee was being paid $18 an hour. If the worker believes that the reason for the difference in pay is because of her membership in a protected class, for example, if she believes it is because she's Somali, this could be something to bring to the Seattle Office for Civil Rights. Another type of discrimination is harassment. Harassment is unwelcome or offensive behavior that is due to a domestic worker's membership in a protected class. To be considered harassment, the behavior must be severe or pervasive. Severe refers to how bad the harassment is, and pervasive is about how often it occurs and how long it goes on for. The employer or hiring entity knows or should have known about the harassment and fails to take action. One example would be a worker who is subjected to sexual harassment by the hiring entity, including attempts to kiss them and inappropriate touching. In this case, the hiring entity knows about the harassment because they are the person perpetrating it. A few more examples include nonverbal harassment, such as looking up and down a person's body, derogatory gestures or facial expressions, or following someone. Visual harassment can include posters, drawings, pictures, screensavers, emails, or text messages. Physical harassment can include assault, impeding or blocking movement, and inappropriate touching. If domestic workers experience harassment, a few questions to consider include how many times incidents occur, how long the harassment goes on for, whether others have experienced the same harassment, and whether there are witnesses to the harassment. Another type of discrimination that domestic workers may experience involves disability and reasonable accommodations. Disability is a protected class. A disability is a sensory, mental, or physical impairment. It can be temporary, like a broken leg, or permanent, common or uncommon, and mitigated or unmitigated, 
meaning that the person may or may not be using medication or assistive devices to address the symptoms of the disability. Reasonable accommodations are changes to tasks or workplace setting that enable a qualified employee with a disability to perform the essential functions of a job. One example would be a worker with a physical disability, which makes it difficult to stand continuously for 10 minutes in one spot while washing the dishes. They can still wash the dishes, but need to break up the 10 minutes of continuous standing. An accommodation in this situation could be a chair. It could be breaking the task up into smaller parts. It could be using the dishwasher instead of hand washing. If a domestic worker has a need for a disability related accommodation, it is the hiring entity's responsibility to work with them to see if there is a reasonable change that can be made that will allow them to perform their work. If a hiring entity refuses to have a dialogue about this or denies a reasonable request, this may be something to report to the Office for Civil Rights. Finally, another type of discrimination that domestic workers may experience is retaliation. Retaliation is a word that people use in common language, but the type of retaliation we're talking about today requires objecting to discriminatory practices protected under the discrimination laws. For example, by reporting discrimination, filing a complaint with an agency, or participating in a discrimination case. This does not apply to other complaints. For example, if a domestic worker made a complaint to the Office of Labor Standards, and believed they were retaliated against as a result, they could not file a retaliation complaint in our office for a civil rights violation. One example of retaliation would be if a domestic worker was fired after telling the hiring entity that they believed they were discriminated against based on their religion or membership in another protected class. For the Seattle Office for Civil Rights to have the legal authority to investigate discrimination the incident needs to be covered by Seattle laws to have happened in the Seattle city limits and for domestic workers to have happened in the last year and six months. If you bring forward a claim of discrimination and it meets all of the required criteria, our office can investigate the case. You would sign a formal version of the complaint and our office would contact the hiring entity. An investigator would meet with you to go over the case in detail and would conduct interviews and gather evidence. If the investigator found that the evidence showed that discrimination occurred, they could assess damages, including making you whole from financial damages and requiring that the hiring entity put measures in place to prevent future discrimination. The first step in making a claim of discrimination is to schedule an intake interview. The intake specialist will gather information about what happened, provide you with information about the process, draft the formal version of your complaint, and provide referrals if needed. If the case is opened, it will be assigned to an investigator. The investigator is an impartial fact finder. They are not an advocate for either party and will not argue on your behalf or on behalf of the hiring entity. The investigator can assist in resolving disputes and will confirm that our office can investigate the case. The investigator applies the legal elements and weighs the evidence to determine whether the majority indicates that unlawful discrimination occurred. The investigator then recommends a finding to the director who reviews and finalizes the decision. If you would like to contact our office about discrimination at work that is based on your membership in a protected class, such as sex, race, religion, national origin, or any of the other classes in the previous list, please do. You can bring a support person with you if you would like, and our office can provide interpretation and translation. To contact us, call 206-684-4500 or email discrimination at seattle.gov or visit our website at www.seattle.gov slash civil rights. And with that, I'll hand it back over to Jennifer with the Office of Labor Standards. At the Seattle Office of Labor Standards and Seattle Office for Civil Rights, we are always looking for ways to help workers understand their rights. In addition to the model notice of rights and pay information that was mentioned earlier, there's also a guide that has information about the protections that we just went over. You can find it in the resources page of the OLS website. For further guidance, please contact OLS directly. You can call us at 206-256-5297 or email us at laborstandards at seattle.gov.
we will be more than happy to answer all of your questions to the best of our ability. This concludes the webinar on Seattle Domestic Workers Ordinance and Seattle Fair Employment Practices Law. I hope that after this comprehensive overview, you have a better understanding of your rights under these two ordinances. On behalf of everyone at the Seattle Office of Labor Standards and the Office for Civil Rights, thank you for your time and enjoy the rest of your day.